Thank you, Tyler. Hey, good morning. What a beautiful morning. Isn't it good? Good to be in this place, in this tent, in this crazy tent. Last week, uh, it rained on us, so we, <laughs> it was actually a lot of fun to be worshiping, and uh, the tent kind of kept the rain off a little bit. Um, hey, God is good all the time. It's a new year, and we're grateful that God is in this year, and we're grateful that God has walked us through last year, and you know, a lot, a lot has changed, right? I think of all the things that have impacted our lives in the last year. And um, God has saw the struggles and the hardships. He was there. He walked us through it. And uh, God is leading us into the good things that are coming this way uh, in this next 2021. So I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful to be here, thankful to get to preach the word. And uh, just a quick announcement, a couple announcements, I suppose. This is going to be the last time I'm going to get to see you for a little while Next Sunday, early in the morning, I had hoped to preach next weekend, that next weekend would be my last time to preach for a while, but um, I couldn't get airfare except on Sunday, like bright and early out of Fresno, and so next Sunday, I will be flying back to Montgomery, Alabama, to Maxwell Air Force Base, and I have three and a half weeks of training, Bible training, chaplain training that I'm going to be at, and so pray for me. Uh, It'll be like, kind of like seminary, you know, Similar type of stuff, learning to uh, do funerals in a chaplain way, funerals, mil- military funerals, military stuff. And so be praying for me. Excited to go do it. I- I'm not excited about being gone for three and a half weeks. Uh, I, do not, I do not like that. I, I get, uh, there's going to be some more freedom than I had this last summer. At OTS, I'm going to get to interact, and I'll probably be able to even FaceTime in with some people. And so I'm grateful for more freedom. I'm not excited about being away, but I am excited about learning and growing and being stretched. And I've already seen how God has used the ministry there at Vandenberg Air Force Base already and just excited to continue to serve God in that way. And I just want to say a big thank you. Thank you to the church board. Thank you to the church. I know this is an expression of ministry that's outside of this town and outside of this church. And uh, sometimes that can be seen as, well, you're dragging the pastor away and what about a case? You know, I'm grateful for the church and their willingness to say, no, if God has laid this on your heart, if you feel like this is uh, an expression that uh, of ministry to people that need Christ, then go for it. And so I'm grateful for that. So be praying for us. Be praying for my family. They'll be fine. Sarah's got things under control, so that's good. Hey, the weekend I'm back, which is February, I think it's 7th is a Sunday. And so that'll be um, the weekend that I'm back. I'm going to get to preach for the first time in a while to my church. It's also going to be the weekend that Pastor Ben is going, our new worship leader, he's going to be uh, leading worship for us that weekend. So it's going to be a lot of fun happening on February. We'll still be outside, all right? And then hopefully, I pray that with things changing and vaccines being set out, sometime soon we'll be able to go back inside. But I'm just grateful for a nice warm morning. This is good stuff. Isn't this good stuff? Thank you for being out here. Hey, we're starting a new series this morning. Uh, Take Up Your Mat is the series title. It's Take Up Your Mat and Other Miracles That We Find in the Gospel of John. So get your Bibles out. Look at John chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and hold them up and repeat out after me. This is my Bible. It is God's holy word. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So John chapter 2. So, um... We're going to talk about miracles. Miracles are um, an interesting topic. It's a topic that a lot of people uh, are are intrigued by, as you can imagine, you know. And Hallmark movies make shows, tons of shows about miracles, and miracles occur, and miracles, you know, it's, miracles are a lot of fun to talk about, but sometimes you're longing for a miracle, and miracles don't come, and so sometimes the talking about miracles can actually frustrate us and disappoint us. And so we're going to talk about miracles for the next seven weeks, miracles that Jesus did. So help me out here. Raise your hand if you think of any of these are miracles. Suppose you're walking on the sidewalk, and you're all alone, and you spot in the middle of the sidewalk a $100 bill just laying there. Is that a miracle? Raise your hand. Is that, is that a miracle that God blessed you with a $100 bill? All right. Uh, how about this? A person is unexplainably cured from a fatal disease. Is that a miracle? Could that be a miracle? All right. How about this? You barely miss being hit 
head on by another car. Is that a miracle? Could that, could that be a miracle? Yeah. All right. Uh, how about this? A friend who has lived a life deep in sin becomes a Christian. Is that a miracle? That's a miracle. How about this? Or t- a tornado hits your neighborhood but does not damage your house. Out here, it'd be a miracle. <laughs> we don't see tornadoes, right? Uh, a little bit. Okay. Um, so miracles, miracles are kind of hard to diagnose. And you can actually explain away a lot of miracles. Kind of, kind of can see it one way, or see it another way. If I see a hundred dollar bill. That might be a miracle because I need that one hundred dollar bill, and that hundred dollar bill is going to go to help me, help other people, something like that. You could see, hey, that's a miracle. Or it could just be, hey, there's a hundred some. Or it could just be one left hundred dollar bill around. That's crazy. Scripture doesn't talk a lot about whether people believe in miracles. It's not an overarching topic in the Bible. Rather, the question is, what do the miracles mean? Or more specifically, how do particular miracles help us to understand and strengthen our belief in God? And through miracles, God is revealing himself to us. And so the question is, what is the purpose of that miracle? We see that in the Gospels. Jesus performed miracles. The question is, did he just do it because he could? Did he do it because he just wanted to? Did he do it because someone asked him to and his heart went out to him, that person, and so he just did a miracle? Or is there a deeper purpose? Is he, through that miracle, intentionally revealing himself to us in a way that we need to understand him? And so that's... in. The Gospel of John, so all of these miracles that we're going to talk about are in the Gospel of John. They're miracles that Jesus did. And John records seven miracles that Jesus performed. John, the Gospel of John is actually miracle light. There are not a ton. In the other Gospels, there are lots of miracles that Jesus did. In the Gospel of John, John reveals to us seven main miracles that Jesus performed. And the question is, why is John... revealing these miracles to us. I mean, it, there are a lot of miracles that Jesus did. Why did he choose these seven to identify this is who Jesus is, this is what Jesus is about? He's trying to reveal to us kind of the intent and the purpose and of, of Jesus himself. And so we're going, for the next seven weeks, we're going to look at these miracles. We'll start with the first one, John chapter 2. So get your Bibles out and look at John chapter 2. We'll jump right into the first miracle that John, who is one of the disciples, Probably a disciple that knew Jesus best. And we'll jump into the first miracle that he records, John chapter 2, starting verse 1. The next day, you say the next day, what happened the previous day? (laughs) What was the next day? What are you talking about? Well, the previous day, the uh, story is Jesus calling some of the disciples to come and follow him. Not all 12. We know there are 12 disciples. But he called the previous days, two days, he calls five of them to come and follow him. Two were John the Baptist's disciples, and then some were, two were fishermen, and another was a friend of them, and so there were five at this point. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Canaan in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. So Jesus' mother, Mary, we know her name, um, she must have known these people that they were at the wedding, and Jesus and his disciples at this point, there were five of them, were also invited to the celebration. Now, weddings back then were a little bit different than the weddings today. Weddings today, you know, maybe they last a couple hours, maybe they last five hours. Um, there's some dancing, you know, the ceremony and things like that. But the weddings back then would last days and days and days, possibly even a week of celebration, long weddings. And they were the type of things that the whole community came out to. This was a celebration. That was for the whole community. And Mary and Jesus and his disciples were there. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. Oh, man. And so this would have been, this would have been not just an embarrassment. This would have been a, a, a blight on the... His weddings were, uh, I mean, you could not, would not. This wouldn't have been an embarrassment for a day. This would have been uh, uh, for generations. All right, that's what... I read this. A scholar said, generations, this would have been remembered as a, a colossal flop, okay, of a wedding. So this would have been a great embarrassment. 
And so the wine, wine supply ran out during the festivity. So Jesus, Jesus' mother told him, at this point, there's no record of Joseph. And so most people believe that Joseph had died. So that was Mary's husband, Jesus' earthly father. And um, so she, Mary must have become fairly comfortable with going to Jesus. He was the oldest boy. He would have been kind of the person that Mary would have gone to if they were dealing with anything in the house, anything in life. And so Jesus' mother, Mary, told him, they have no more wine, implying Jesus' help. Do something about this. Verse 4, dear woman, that's not our problem. So Jesus is hesitant. He's saying, "What's the? it doesn't matter to me. I don't, I'm not a big wine drinker anyway. I mean, this is not my business, dear woman. He, in some translations, you probably, uh, maybe the King James, Jesus says, woman, all right, which is, kind of sounds a little harsh and cold, but um, Jesus was respectful, and he, was, he, he loved his mother for sure, so he is honoring his mother, dear woman, but that's not our problem. Jesus is reluctant to do anything about this. He says, my time has not yet come. All right, this is the first time in the book of John that he says this statement, my time has not yet come, and so Mary probably is not really sure what he means by saying my time has not yet come, but this is not the last statement. Last time this, this statement is said by Jesus, we find out later what he's talking about, my time has not yet come, is it's not time to die. That, that it's not time to start the clock ticking toward the cross. And so Jesus is saying, no, if I do this miracle, I'm stepping into the cross. And it's not, it's not time, is what he says. My time has not yet come. But... His mother, so Jesus is reluctant. Mary will not take no for an answer. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Which, of course, is the key to a miracle. You want, do, you want a miracle in your life, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Verse 6, standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Now, that's a lot of water. You know those buckets, those five-gallon buckets, that water? If you've ever filled them up and tried to lift it up, they're heavy. They're heavy. And so that's just five gallons of water. This car- these things carry 20 to 30 gallons of water. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremonies. So the servants followed his instruction. When the master of the ceremonies tasted the water, that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then, when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the least, less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until expensive wine. But you have now. This miraculous sign at Canaan in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this scripture. We're grateful that we have record of it. We're thankful, Lord, that John wrote it down so that we can learn more about your son through it. Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, help us to hear you, help us to experience you, help us to know that you are King of kings, Lord of lords. And I pray that we would surrender our lives to you this year. Lord, like the disciples learned to believe in you through a miracle, Lord, strengthen our belief in you. Through the little things that we see, and through um, scripture that we read, and prayers that are answered. And I pray, as I look out, I think of all the hard things that have happened to people that are here this morning. And I pray that you would comfort. I pray that you would draw near. And I pray that even in the trials of life, that we would strengthen our faith and believe in you even more. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, at first glance, what can we learn of this story? Um, There's lots that we can learn here. Um, Some, Jesus has authority over the natural world. That Jesus Jesus can turn water into wine, which, depending on how you feel about wine, might get you really excited or might be like, that's silly. (laughs) 
But that's what we learn, that Jesus, we also learn that Jesus is at a party. He's at a wedding. All right? And sometimes when we think about Jesus, we can see him as kind of a somber and serious fella. And certainly he was serious at times. But we also know that Jesus spent a lot of time with people at parties, at weddings and different celebrations. And, and Jesus' mission was people. And so he went to where people were at. So we learn about Jesus kind of his. And Jesus honored his mother and he did what his mother had asked. Something else we can learn about that. Um, Jesus cared about the people. He did the miracle, even if there weren't a ton of people that would know that he did the miracle. He still blessed people, that Jesus cared for people. There's a lot that we can learn about this miracle at first glance. Um, but we can also dig deeper. We can dig deeper. And what, do, what does this say about Jesus here? What is John trying to communicate to us and all the, the, those that he wrote this to about Jesus. There's one word that jumps off the page. All right, look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, This miraculous sign at Canaan and Galilee was, first, was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. That word glory is very significant to John. Uh, it's the word doxin in the Greek, and John uses it over and over and over again. He uses it uh, over 20 times in Scripture. And as, you, as he marches, as Jesus marches to the cross, it seems like John continues to kind of open up a little bit more of the glory door. Where at first it's just, at this point, there's just a little crack that we can see just a little glimpse of Jesus' glory. And as we get closer and closer and closer to Jesus' mission, this doxin glory is used more and more and the door opens broader and brighter so that people can see what Jesus' glory really is. John uses that glory a lot. You look at it here at, at first in John chapter 2. This is the first time, this is the first glimpse of Jesus' glory. John chapter 12, a little bit further in his ministry, he says this, John chapter 12, 23. Jesus replied, now the time has come. So chapter 2, it's not time. Chapter 12, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. Now the time, chapter 12, 24, verse 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. He goes on to say in verse 27, now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. You see, he's opening up the door of God's glory a little bit more and a little bit more. And when he's talking about the glory that he would have, he talks about a kernel that dies, seed that dies in the ground. And, and Jesus is saying, and John is trying to clearly communicate to us that the glorification of Jesus is his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and ultimately, it was the sending of the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus' glory. That's Jesus' mission. John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39, it says this. On the last days, the climax of the festival, this is Jesus at another festival. He's always partying. Jesus stood and he shouted to the crowd, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare... Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said this, living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered his glory. So this, this glory is Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, his ascension, and the giving of the Holy Spirit. And this in John chapter 2 is Jesus giving his first peak at the glory. This is, this is the first puzzle piece to the puzzle that's marked the glory of Jesus. And so, <clears throat> how does turning water to wine reveal Jesus' glory? Yeah, it's just ordinary stuff. And actually, in the, in the book of John, if you, if you want to read particular things that kind of jump off the page, read about water, read about blood, 
read about God's glory because he uses these words over and over to indicate of what Jesus came to do and what he accomplished on the cross. In order to dig a little bit deeper, to find out how the turning the water into wine indicates Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, and giving the Holy Spirit, you have to look at the six jars. They were made of stone, and they were used for ceremonial cleansing. This is a common Jewish practice. It is, it is uh, washing your hands. In order to um, worship, in order to draw close um, worship to God, in order to engage in worship to God and prayer, it was critical for the Jewish people to cleanse themselves. And according to Jewish tradition, stone jars would be the preferred container instead of the typical clay jar because stone jars could not become unclean and contaminate the water. So these large stone jars were designated for purification, and they were rarely used for any other purpose. So when John wrote this account, and when Jesus told the servants, fill up those jars, and when those jars became wine, it would have caused their eyebrows to raise a little bit and saying, well, you're using those jars for the wrong purpose. They would have been like, wait a minute. Why would ceremonial cleansing jars made of stone be used to deliver wine? And it would have been clear to those who read this account that the jars had something to do with the central message that Jesus is trying to communicate. What is he trying to communicate? Jesus is giving a deeper meaning to the old law. The old law was ceremonial ceremonial cleansing and these practices. um, This was a part of the Jewish tradition. And Jesus clearly communicated that that he did not come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. And this is a foreshadow of the fulfilling of the law. He was communicating from the very beginning of his earthly ministry is what we don't need is more hand cleansing. <laughs> that it doesn't matter how many times you wash your hands, it's not going to fix the problem. From the very beginning, this is a foreshadow that Jesus came not to cleanse the hands, but to cleanse the heart. And what we need is purification from sin, not purification from germs. And this miracle points to a time when the disciples would be in the upper room with the cup and the bread. And Jesus said that this is the cup of the new covenant. And what's in this cup is is wine, but it really represents my blood that will be the cleansing, mean cleansing. It will be shed for the cleansing of your sin. He's pointing to a time when the Holy Spirit will be poured out in Acts chapter 2. And everyone that sees it says, well, these people had too much wine to drink. I said, no. This is the Holy Spirit that's filling them up. It's pointing to the time that we read about in Revelation when the, the bridegroom and the bride will be married. This miracle is also linked to water baptism. In this miracle, the servants were told to take a dip. And, and lift out with a spoon and deliver to the master of the ceremony. And water was turned to wine. We don't know when water was turned to wine. Was it turned to wine before they took the dip? Was it turned to water when they took the dip and carried it over to the servant, the master of the ceremony? Was it turned to wine when he lifted it up to his lips? We don't know. But it's connected to baptism in that the sinner is put in water and comes out in new creation. I mean, water, in some ways, is similar to wine. The old Michael is kind of similar in some ways to the new Michael, but a redeemed, restored, reconciled, healing kind of Michael. It's connected to water baptism. The imagery is thick and it's rich. And it points, this is, it's just one miracle. It's the first miracle that John records. It points to Jesus' mission, and it kicks off his public ministry. Who's it for? I mean, when I kick off something, I usually want to go out strong. You know, like, 
go big or go home, right? When you start something, you want to show it to the world. But really, honestly, there aren't that many people that actually know about this miracle. There are a lot of people that are affected by the miracle. I mean, they get to drink good wine. But there are only few that know that what happened, the servants and the disciples. And we know the disciples knew because in verse 11, this miraculous sign at Canaan and Galilee was first the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. I think this miracle largely was just done for them. Jesus didn't need to let the whole world know he was the Messiah. It wasn't time to convince the whole world that he was king of kings, lord of lords, God incarnate. What he needed to do was convince those five men that left their fishing nets and came and followed him. So sometimes miracles are done for the masses. Sometimes it's just done so that your faith can grow. And that's enough. And these disciples, at the time, they believed in Jesus enough to follow him. I mean, they believed it, but they still had questions. They had doubts. In fact, Nathaniel, which is one of these disciples, he said, what good thing could come from Nazareth? So he still had his doubts. And so this miracle went to strengthen their faith in the Savior. Now, this is, <laughs> they, they had a lot of growing that needed to take place. I mean, this wasn't the end of their belief. They had to stretch and grow and mature, but it's the start. During World War II, General Douglas MacArthur wanted an island airfield from which to launch his forces. So he invaded the Indonesian island of Bayak. Six months after they secured the island, in June of 1944, a chaplain named Leon Maltby arrived on the island to minister to the troops. He wanted to serve communion, but he had nothing to serve it with. He found some unused 50 caliber bullets. He used new shells because he didn't want to use anything that had been used to kill. He pulled out the lead, the gunpowder, the firing caps. He welded them, he pressed them in the right shape, and then he shined them up. Each took about two hours to complete, and he made enough for 80 communion cups to serve his men. 1945, Chaplain Maltby sailed into Japan and actually was the first Protestant chaplain to enter Japan. He became good friends with the local Japanese pastor. He used that same communion set to serve the Lord's pastor. He used that same Lord's Supper with him, which moved the Japanese pastor deeply. The set is now on display at the Veterans Museum in Daytona Beach, where a sign reads, the pastor clearly understood the significance of instruments of death becoming a symbol of eternal life. We're talking about ceremonial things in the law. Paul writes in Romans 7.10, I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. So Paul, <clears throat> he was a Pharisee. He knew all about the rules and the rituals. He would have known ceremonial cleansing. He would have performed ceremonial cleansing all the time. And he said these things that were supposed to bring life had no power to bring life. But they only brought death. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 3 of chapter 8, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So it's not the law's issue. It's our own issue that we, we cannot, there is no cleansing that we can do that could ever save us. So God did what the law could not do, he writes. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. In that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. This miracle that was done at this wedding was pointing to what Christ came to do. 
And when we take the communion cup, if you have a communion cup, go ahead and grab it and pull it out. If you didn't get one, I think Doug has some extras back there. Just raise your hand and we'll get you a cup. You know, um, the inability for jars washing to save us is very similar to our own righteous acts. That we, we want our righteous acts to amount to something, right? And they do. It's good to be holy. It's good to be godly. It's good to be righteous. It's good to read your Bible. It's good to pray. I mean, these are all righteous and good behaviors. And they should be commended. I commend you. Do it it more often. But the reading of the scripture and the holy living that you do cannot save you any more than jars of water can save you from sin. God needs to do a new work in our hearts. And this new work can only be done by saying yes to Jesus, making him our Lord and Savior, and forsaking all others and following him. And he will do something in us that we can... He will turn water to wine. He will make us instruments that bring life instead of death. He'll take this mouth of ours that often spews animosity toward others and use it to bring life He'll use these feet and these hands that have for the longest time only been used to serve ourselves. Serve me, serve me, I'm the king. And he will use them to serve others, especially those who are weak, poor, and marginalized. What the church needs, there's this whole thing that Jesus says about putting new wine and old wineskins and how it destroys the wineskins. As we enter this new year, we need... The, the Holy Spirit to fill us up anew and afresh and take us from ordinary to extraordinary. We need to do a miracle in our hearts, a miracle in our churches, to set us a, a, a fire again. With every head bowed and eyes closed, if there's anyone here that feels distant from God, feel like you have been trying to do it on your own and you failed over and over again would you say this prayer Jesus I repent I repent of my trying to wash enough trying to live holy enough Lord I invite you to come I invite you to come into my heart and cleanse me Lord, I desire to live for you. Lord, I pray that these things that I used to do on my own would no longer control me, but Lord, help me to be controlled by you. Do a miracle in my life. Lord, do a miracle in our church. What this world needs is less of us and more of you. Help us to deliver you, to be people that live godly Christian lives so that you can see us, so they can see you and us. If there are things that are distancing yourself from God, lay them down at his feet right now. God, I give you my fears. I give you my doubts. What I give you my need to be right. God, I give you my need to have stuff, to accumulate stuff.
And I pray that you would do a new thing in our hearts and our lives. Once again, turn water to wine. Do a miracle. Strengthen our trust and our faith in you. Strengthen our... The night that Jesus was betrayed, he met with his disciples. These are disciples that had seen Jesus do these things over and over again. And they had great hope that Jesus would elevate himself to a position of king, higher than even Caesar Augustus. And that's how they envisioned the Messiah was going to rule. What they didn't know, and Jesus tried to reveal his glory to them, but it seemed like they were too stubborn to see it. Jesus said, I must become less. I need to serve. And he showed him what it looked like to serve by taking the, bat, the, the water and the towel and washing their feet. And he took the cup and he took the bread. Have you guys pulled it out? It's kind of tricky. You got to take the little top layer first. And he said that this is my body, which will be broken for you. Take it and eat. Then he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant indicating that he is completing the law. He said, this is the new covenant, and this is my blood, which will be shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Lord, I pray for our church. Fill us up with your spirit. Lord, I pray for those who are weary. Lord, I pray that they would sense your peace. Lord, I pray for those that are excited. May they be excited for you. Lord, we praise you. We glorify your great name. We also are mindful of the fact that you told us that we must lay down our lives and follow you. So help us to lay down our desires, our goals, our ambition, and make you our love this year. We pray this in the matchless name, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Let's all stand. All right, say this with me. Love God, live as a family, and go and make disciples. God bless you guys.